Now, the reason we brought you guys here is to talk about Wayne Gretzky. He is, we have uh, a secret, though. What is it? Oh, yeah. So we have a Let's secret, tell what happened. but we got to tell you what happened. Because a lot of people, a lot of people, we get a lot of people, we get letters. Uh, a lot of people are saying, Dana and David, there was, yeah, they was like, I don't yeah, know which talk, podcast, podcast it was, was but you guys talked talk over. over. Sorry, talk. Each other. Yes, and, and they said, Dana. You know what? Okay. I was trying to illustrate it. I mean, you know. I think they get it. Okay. They've heard we talk podcast. over each other a lot. There was a technical issue with our buddy Wayne Gretzky. So that we could not talk over or laugh or make a sound it was when he was talking. It was fucking torture. It was fucking amazing. I loved it. We're, so this is the test to you. <laughs> what do you like better? Do you this like when it. we shut the fuck up and act professional and yeah. respect the or guests? Or when we're just... Or when we're... We're, la, 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 and then, we're giggling and we're laughing. If you want us quiet, this is your podcast. But just so you will listen to the podcast, Wayne Gretzky happened to be a great guest yeah. with this technical issue. He had great stories, and I'd kind of signal to him. But for me personally, I had to wait. I'm looking at his face on the Zoom and going, yeah. I think he stopped talking. Yeah. We should start talking now. It was very hard. We had a long pause, <laughs> and I go, because we would laugh during, like, right at the beginning, I knew oh. we were in trouble, because he goes, when I started hockey, and I go, I played hockey! And he's like. And, you know, because we well, this jump was over it. him because we cut him out. David, let's do whatever. This is us. I'm seeing him on the Zoom. He's seeing me. So we couldn't. He was saying stuff was making us laugh. But we literally, if we laughed at all, his like sound this. would drop. So most of the time I'm seeing David do this. Yeah, because we can't. We can't even like make one noise. Yeah. Because his sound cuts out. He's the greatest, He's uh, the greatest. hockey player of all time. He's supernaturally humble about his yeah. stats. He's always saying, no, there's plenty of great hockey players out there. That's the best I could do. That's pinch. good. Yeah. Um, but uh, he hosted SNL when I was there and it turned out it w to be a really charming, great episode. So we, we talk about that. And that was a big moment in his life. These professional athletes who host SNL, it's kind of a badge of honor if your episode was good. And so he travels with that. And so that was a fun we part. We tried to get him to say he's good. <laughs> he never No, he wouldn't. Give himself himself what a about the stats? Like no one has ever scored more than 100 points this season. He scored yeah. over 200 six times. What about that? Well, I don't know. They're just stats. They don't mean much. You know, it sounds like, like one of the Wayne. Muppets in the balcony. <laughs> Wayne? Uh, oh, I don't know. Well, it's the best I can do in a pinch, eh? Yeah, uh, he was great. But so love, here he love is. Wayne and Gretzky. Yes, it's very different because it's, there's there's pauses, so fucking deal with it. And we don't even giggle when they're funny. You can't hear us, but we're just off mic. And he says funny things, and we can't. We're not allowed to do anything. Okay, that's all. You'll figure it out. <laughs> Wayne Gretzky. Write us your comments. Where? I don't know. I heard that David actually is a speed golfer. Like he doesn't, he walks up the ball and hits it. And according to John Lovitz, is a pretty darn good player. Yeah, but anybody look good playing beside John Lovitz. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> right off the bat. <laughs> Why do you say Blasphemy. that? me. I didn't mean just David. I mean all of us. Yeah. No, no one can golf, basically. I, I'm always surprised a guy who's shooting like 120, swearing and swinging the club and angry. I'm going, dude, you're, you're, you're going to shoot 120. Why are you angry? Just have fun. <laughs> you know, Wayne is, uh, I've seen him out at Sherwood and the infuriating thing about him, among other things, is uh, he's, he's, Pretty good hockey, and he's very good at golf. And he, oh. yeah. Well, you're better than Wayne, me. Yeah, Wayne, are you good at golf? Just a question. I'm, I'm very average at best. Well, Danny, he smoked me. So, <laughs> <laughs> well, if I, if you, with legal rules, no mulligans on a on a, a PGA course, could you, if I said the word ninety as a score, would that sound familiar, high or low? If I could play the senior tees for 60 years old and over. <laughs> Do they move those up? I didn't even know that. Yeah, you know, I, I can't play back where my son-in-law plays. I'd shoot 120. So you, your son-in-law is one of the best golfers in the world. So that must be weird going out and playing with Dustin Johnson, <laughs> I assume. I don't know. You know what's funny about it? Everybody always says to me, the first question is always, how many shots does he give you? <laughs> you think I'm stupid? He's always my partner. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> that's a very smart move. I think I saw a scorecard uh, uh, at at Shadow Creek of 
Maybe you, you, it was you and Dustin. Maybe you guys are all playing, but it was a very low scorecard. Yeah, he's when, good. when you're playing with a pro and it's just for fun, mm -hmm. are they almost extra great in a way because they're so relaxed? Do they take more chances or they're just kind of laissez-faire? They're all different, but I will tell you this. I play a lot, obviously, more with Dustin than any of them. He's so cordial to everybody on the course. He loves to help people. If you guys played with him, you would walk off the course and say, what a wonderful guy, how nice he was. And I don't care who you are. Uh, you get nervous playing with him. I still get a little bit nervous, even though we play a lot <laughs> together. You don't want to embarrass yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> no, I've heard that from other people, too, what, what a gentleman he is. And that must be great to have a son-in-law that is so cool. Oh, I have a, oh yeah, Dwayne, I got to uh, play with Tiger to, to get a, um, a lesson for one of his shows or something. And I saw the show. Oh, you did. Okay. So, you know, it was a knee, knee clacker. It didn't talk about nerves. And even though he couldn't be cooler and, uh, you know, obviously bored to tears with me, but he was super cool, super cordial, helpful, gave me, re you know, in so much pain, he was in so much pain then Wayne, this was you know, the day before the accident. So he, it was his last, not round, but I did five holes with him. But uh, I told everyone it was 18, but um, we did five. And then, you know, he'd tell me I got the bunker. He'd get down and give me reads. And I remember asking him then, do you think you'll ever play again? Just be, I don't even know why I asked him that because he was so sore from a back operation. And then he crashed the next day. And I thought, oh, I don't think he can, he'll play again. And then he was better than me within minutes. Again. <laughs> Well, <laughs> um, few athletes come around the world as good as he is and was. I can tell you this, the respect that he has, not only from people like you and myself that see him play and mm -hmm. watch him, but I can remember four and five years ago asking Dustin, what do you guys think? Do you think he can win another major? And there wasn't one guy that said, no, he won't win another one. They all to a man said, you know what? He's so unique and so good, he's going to win another major. Little did I know that would be the Masters that Dustin came second in. I said, Dustin, of all the majors he's got to win, he's got to beat you by one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. One of the most chilling moments in sports was him winning that. I'm sorry about your son-in-law, but I was just such an incredible comeback. And, uh, you know, you are, you, you're in that pantheon. I mean, you are, people talk about Tiger Woods and you know, there's, it's a really small, small group up on Mount Rushmore in, in uh, athletics and you're up there with Tiger. And um, that's why we're happy to have you on the show. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm thrilled to be on the show because obviously uh, I know both of you guys, but I'm big fans of both of you guys. And more importantly, you're both good people. And uh, it's my pleasure to be here today. Oh, well, that's nice. Dwayne, do you remember the day you went from the pretty good one to the great one? Walk us through that day. <laughs> he not, was two. <laughs> you're not going to want to hear this because I was 10 and it was so silly. Uh, I was 10 years old. I scored 400 goals <laughs> from that team. And so when I was five and I got one goal, I remember I cried on the way home at the end of the year, and my dad said, don't worry, you're going to be okay. And I was like, I only got one goal. But I got 400 goals, and this guy, a writer, he wrote, every good athlete has a nickname. And he nicknamed me at the age of 10, the great one, and I was so mad. None of my teammates ever called me that. None of my friends ever called me that. But it kind of stuck with me for life, and I've had it since I was 10. Wow. Um, what was your nickname, uh, David, when you were 10? Uh, mine, was mine was Knucklehead. <laughs> mine was Shrimp Cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, didn't love it. Actually, I had read that your, your dad had helped you uh, with all that. And I remember when I was four, my dad gave me a Nerf football, and then he drove off, and that was it. So... Uh, <laughs> 
Uh, we have a did not a similar <laughs> well, situation. Well, at least you had a parting <laughs> gift. I, I don't. Want I, uh, <laughs> I didn't know it was a parting gift. He goes, "Hey, play the dad home game. Here's a football and get fucked." <laughs> it's our. It's a. It's a point of view. But obviously, you talk a lot about your relationship with your dad, and I was just curious about your whole family playing hockey outside at night and just this whole culture of hockey. Well, your dad was just a crazy fan, right, of the of the sport, of the game. You know, he really wasn't. That's the that's the. Oh. <laughs> it was more me than my dad. When I was like three and four, he would take me to outdoor parks and ponds because we didn't, we couldn't afford to skate indoors. And I would skate all day. And he decided one day, he said, you know what? I can't take this anymore. I'm going to build a rink in the backyard so I can sit in the kitchen and drink hot tea and watch him in the backyard. So it wasn't, he never pushed me. I get parents that ask me all the time. They'll say, will you tell my son how many hours a day he used to practice? And I would say, you know, I never practiced. It was just, that's what I'd love to do. Yeah. From nine in the morning to six at night, have dinner. Sometimes I'd skate eight o'clock to 10 o'clock at night in the backyard by myself. And people would say, don't you think you're missing something? You're, you know, hanging out with your friends, going to movies. I, I never thought I missed anything. And there was passion in my love, but my dad and mom both supported me. But they never pushed me one time, uh, ever. Uh, it was never even an issue in my house. So. You know, our house is really unique because my five kids are older now. I have a daughter that plays tennis at SMU. I had a son who was a golfer, but now is kind of, he's at NYU taking business. Uh, I had a son that got drafted by the Cubs. And I have an older son who loves hockey and does hockey clinics around the world with him and I. And we have, you know what? There was never any pressure from me. I never pushed them. Um, listen, sports is our life. Um, I've got to travel the world. I got to meet some wonderful people, some great opportunities. And it's all because I had a love and a passion for a sport and nobody ever pushed me. Well, for all you pushy parents out there, know that, you know, but, it's I, like, it, but I will tell you, it's the greatest thing in the world, whether you're six years old or a professional athlete, to look in the stands and see your mom and dad and your spouse there. The support is so important. Uh, every athlete will tell you the exact same thing. Did you ever do fantasy sports? Because when I was a kid, you know, it'd be like shooting, and it's good. Did you ever like out there by yourself go and great sees coming in and great see passes off? It's back to Gretzky. Gretzky scores. Did you have fantasies in your head as a little kid by yourself on the ice at ten o'clock at night? Every day, but I, I didn't. I it was Gordy Howe. Uh, I always idolized Gordy Howe. At five years old, I got a Gordy Howe hockey jersey for Christmas. My parents could have rewrapped it every year, and I would have been happy. Uh, we didn't have a lot of money; it's been fine by me. So Gordy was my guy. Um, everything was Gordy Howe scores game seven overtime uh, hat trick for Gordy Howe. Uh, yeah, we all did it. Every one of us. And if, you, if you're saying you didn't do it, you're lying because we all did it. <laughs> What did you What did you think when you first met Gordy Howe? Uh, what that must have been intense. Oh my gosh! I'll tell you my Gordy Howe story. So I met him when I was ten, and you know when you meet your idols sometimes in sports that you know you go, well, it was okay. Or your parents say, how was it meeting Gordy? And I remember I told my dad, I said, you know, he's bigger and better and nicer than I even had in my mind. Um, and then at 16 years old, I played with his youngest son, Murray, who went on to become a doctor. He's a doctor in Detroit. We played together, and we'd get on the team bus. And Murray was a real diligent student, and he would have all these books. And every time we'd get on the bus, I'd sit with Murray, and Murray would say, Wayne, where are your books? And i go, well, uh, okay, next game, books. But there was one game I came walking on the bus, and I had six books. And I went to sit down beside Murray, and he goes, I'm glad to see you're taking this seriously. He says, what do you got? Geometry, math, English. And I said, well, I got Gordie Howe, how to be a great hockey player. Gordie Howe, hockey tips. Gordie Howe lessons. I said, you want to be a doctor? I want to be Gordie Howe. <laughs> so did, I, <laughs> did, he, did he ever write a book, How to Be Gordie Howe? <laughs> well, I know one thing. When I was a kid, 
you you'll laugh at this because I was like six years old and I sat down in the barber's seat. My mom took me to get a haircut and they said, Mrs. Gretzky, what do you want to do to his hair? And I turned to the barber and I said, can I get a Gordie Howe haircut? <laughs> That's how much I like Gordie Howe. <laughs> Wow. Well, David, you had similar thoughts about me, right? Because I'm a little older. When I saw Dana, actually, I ran into my dad when I was 20 and he goes, I guess you didn't make the NFL. I go, what? He goes, I gave you that football. What a gold bricker. <laughs> he said it was two colors. You were spoiled. Uh, no, I, I was a skateboarder, Wayne. And, uh, you know, I think it's nice It'd be nice to be in your position. I think Dana and I uh, have it in a smaller way. But when you do something and you see these guys, like if I ran into Dan Aykroyd, you know, I was the same way with comedy. I think Dana was too. So you run into a guy that Steve Martin, someone you grew up listening to albums or the exact same scenario. And if they turn out to be cool, yeah. uh, it's it's very nice. And then if anyone says hi to me just because they saw something and if it's even close to that scenario... And they're probably going to only see me once. You know, they run into me at the Cheesecake Factory. If you can be nice for one second, that's going to probably be it for them. You know, they're not going to run into you again. What are the chances? So I try. I know Dane is very cool to people. And I know, Wayne, I saw you out at the uh, golf course. And uh, always cool to everyone. Even Kid Rock. You were nice to everyone. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, Kid Rock is a great singer, Dana. And if you don't believe me, ask him. And, and has, has Robert been in the news lately? <laughs> As what? Has Robert been in the news lately? <laughs> oh, uh, yeah. You know, that's why I always crop him out of my photos on Instagram. <laughs> I can't take the um, comments. <laughs> <laughs> well, for our listeners, just to reiterate, you, have, you still have 61 records, right? Or is that just w Wikipedia stuff or NHL records? I honestly, I don't keep track of it, but I, whenever I go somewhere, that's what they say. So you, you would know as much as I do, honestly. <laughs> I, I tried to put you in context for other people. I don't even know how to do it because you were the, weren't you the best player in the world by the time you're 17? No, no. But let, let me say this. People ask me this all the time, <laughs> you know, cause it's all subjective, right? It's what you believe. And so for me, I always say that Ali, Jordan, and Tiger were the three greatest athletes that I ever saw. And I happened to get to know three of them, and they were all really nice to me. So, listen, that's the great thing about sports, right? We sit around and we debate who is the best team, who is the greatest athlete, who is the best hockey player, who is the best baseball player. It's all debatable. There's so many great athletes. It's like your business. There's so many good people in your business can't just sit there and say, well, this guy is the greatest ever. There's so many good people. It's all personal choice. Yeah. I mean, there are a few stats that are at least eye popping, but, but there's others, you know, 10 MVPs or I mean, you scored over 200 points. No one else. David, let me, it. Dana, let me explain. I, I, I've got the stats. He I, has, <laughs> he won the heart trophy, which is He's for really being good. The yes, nicest, the heart, the heart trophy is for the nicest person. I think, uh, I don't really know how it works, but he has a big heart. And you can tell. And um, he has, <laughs> reading his Wikipedia, you know that we don't know. And we're not laughing during, while you're talking, Wayne, because it cuts out. So this is killing Dane and I. We can't laugh over you and we can't talk over you. And it's killing we're us. We're smiling. Because uh, if you think we're laugh. not doing it, it's because you cut out. So we have to be, we're training ourselves. So yeah. um, uh, I do love all this shit about him, but he doesn't like to talk about himself. I can tell. But I, I have an interesting question. Maybe. Yeah. Well, I found it fascinating that as a as a young man, you had to move out of your hometown because you were so famous, and you're like 14. You move it with a family. And what I found interesting because I, uh, you know, have kind of a fear of flying. I'm not terrible, but I'm, <laughs> and that you were flying around in a DC three that could only go to nine thousand feet. Going around <laughs> as a 14 year old in a hockey league. What was that like? It was horrible. I really got over it because of it. All I could think of was, was it Ricky Valens that died in a DC3. Um, we were always right in the middle of the worst weather you can ever imagine. And <laughs> I think uh, Edmonton and Calgary is cold. Sault Ste. Marie gets more snow and is colder than Edmonton. Trust me. So it was a tough year, but. You know what? I got through it and <laughs> everything worked out okay.
And then you tried to help me dovetailing to your great SNL appearance. Because oh. we we talked about it, and you'd said, I'll tell you at the end of the week, during the week of SNL, how to get over your fear of flying. And you wouldn't tell me all week. And then when the show ended, you said, one word, helicopters. <laughs> <laughs> Explain that. <laughs> oh, it was stay out of an airplane if you don't like it. There's no, I've done everything. I've been to hypnotherapists. I've been in simulators. I've flown with the best pilots in the world. It's just a, listen, I've never had a speeding ticket in my life, and I don't like heights, so it's a bad combination. Hmm. Although I'm a little bit older, I'm better. Janet and I traveled to the Caribbean two or three times this winter. I'm, I'm doing things that I used to not do because I said, you know what, I don't need to get an airplane. Um, but Either you're comfortable flying or you're not. There's no in between. And it's as simple as that. Wow. Well, I I uh I'm a kindred spirit. I feel for you. If it if it's good weather and it's going good and it just everything feels good, I can start to relax and enjoy it. Mostly it's weather driven or something happening. I'm the same as you. I check the weather. I know when we're, where we're flying to. I hate flying into places like Aspen and Places there, or Phoenix at two in the afternoon in June. I tried a helicopter once, like you guys are talking about. Um, I, I'm sort of in the middle with flying. Uh, don't love it. It makes no sense to me, so it's hard. And the bumps, of course. But at that first helicopter, the guy goes, uh, before we get on, how much do you weigh? And I'm like, I don't know, more like 145. He goes, more like 145. Six or one forty four. I go. This can't matter. It, why, why does it matter? He goes. Well, you're going to have to sit on the left. We got to even it out. I don't like that it's that close. And then when we heard these noises, he goes, "You know what? These things have a way of figuring themselves out in the air. Let's go for." I'm like, "Wait, what? What?" So when you when you're doing that, and it's like an imprecise science of, I'm on some jalopy, and I don't know any history of it. Dana's smart enough. He looks up every flight he's on. Looks up the pilots. Smart. You, it helps a little. I was on a private jet once where it was for a corporate gig and the two pilots that were full board, just me with two young guys. And then they aborted the takeoff and then they start really fighting, like yelling at each other. Fuck you, man. It was my fault. You, they're, they're screaming. I'm going, should I get off this plane? <laughs> then they kind of calmed down. So we're going to try it again. But they were mad at each other the whole flight. So stuff like that. It's just weird. Of course. <laughs> Try it again. What the fuck? Wayne, can we dovetail into your SNL appearance? <laughs> yeah, let's do. Okay. I, I will uh, walk you through it. Uh, <laughs> so I'm flying in the airplane and Lawrence's office had called me and asked me to do Saturday Night Live. And I said, are you out of your mind? I, I spent the year with uh, Larry and uh, Dee Dee Gordon and Jerry De Bruckheimer, two of the best people in the industry and I'm like, I don't want anything to do with having to act. Or I said, you know what? Thank you. I appreciate the offer. I was on an airplane. I was flying to the East Coast. I was going to the Kentucky Derby. And I was reading the newspaper. And in the newspaper, it said Wayne Gretzky to host Saturday Night Live. And I didn't even, I pulled the paper down. I looked at my wife and I said, okay, I know you called Lauren. She goes, you're going to thank me at the end of the week. And that's how i And let me tell you. I, I was so nervous the whole entire time from Tuesday, even taking the pictures on Tuesday, I was nervous. But I want to tell you, between Dana and Mike and Dennis Miller, John Lovitz, and our hometown boy, Phil Hartman, they took me under their wing every single day, every half hour. They'd say, don't memorize a word. Don't worry about anything. We got you covered. Just go with the flow. If you make a mistake, we'll cover you up. So I said, okay, I, I feel good. I can get through this. And then I got really nervous when I'm standing behind the door at 1133. The gentleman says, don't go out there on the first name of Wayne Gretzky. When they say Wayne Gretzky the second time, I'm going to open the door. You go out. And I said, okay, I got that. So they say Wayne Gretzky. I don't move. And he told me, the old guy, and he said, don't be nervous. There's probably 25 million people watching live. And that's when I got nervous. I Who said, would say that? Oh, my God. The guy that went, you got to be kidding me. 
So we went up and we, I was so fortunate. Um, we had the fine young cannibals were the music group that year. It was kind of a, um, uh, interesting time because I, I really was, uh, excited to do it. I was thrilled. There was so much Canadian content on the show that they helped carry me through it, but I ended up having a riot. I had a ball. I'm glad my wife said, you're doing the show. Dana and Mike and, uh, as I said, Phil and John especially couldn't have been nicer. And Lauren was uh, really special to me. And somebody said, did you make any mistakes? And I said, I don't think I really made any mistakes. And they said, would you ever do it again? And I said, no, because I can make mistakes the next time <laughs> I'm done. So it was one of those things. I'm so thrilled that I did it. I'm proud of it. And um, gosh, it was a lot of fun. Dana, Dana and Mike made it a lot of fun. Well, Mike, as you know, being a Canadian and I know he has a Canadian order, you guys all get like awards. I don't know what your order of something is, but yeah. Mike was so excited you were there. And uh, we all knew the, the idea of a professional athlete has never done sketch comedy and now he's going to do live sketch comedy. So we all understand how insane it is <laughs> and, so, and liked you. Go ahead like putting you on the ice <laughs> well uh, to dovetail to that so we did a pre-tape which is just a funny memory of my time on snl involving wayne here i uh i you know we didn't really play hockey out in california at that time so i was playing garth and we're doing a pre-tape and where wayne uh our mike myers wayne is gonna beat the real wayne <laughs> and, and your wife is looking whatever the sketch was it was very funny but I was trying to get get my skates on and lace them up. So uh, Wayne, this Wayne gets on one knee and helps me lace up my skates. And I go, that that's kind of cool, <laughs> you know. It's unbelievable. And then actually. I got up and I I held the hockey puck, but I I I wasn't doing it right. So Wayne goes, excuse me, uh, hold it like this. So I just thought, is this like Babe Ruth teaching you how to like stand in the <laughs> and swing a bat? So anyway, that was quite a thrill. And you you. You're you're incredibly nice as people know listening to this. I don't know. There's a phrase Canadian nice. I think it's cultural, but you were uh, so sweet. And uh, before we get into the minutia of the show, what happened was the show just caught fire on air and you caught fire on air. And that that really stood out to me. The show really landed live and that doesn't always happen. So you guys were the best. I I, I, I couldn't ever do it again because you guys were so good. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, I saw the clip of him and Victoria Jackson and uh, you got that spade feathered hair. My hair was exactly that look back then. It was like <laughs> way back. I don't know if that was a wig or it was your hair because sometimes in the show they put you in a wig that looks like your hair. No, no. Let, let me tell you something. So we do all these skits, right? And as you guys know, they do, I guess, four or five extra skits that go in the uh, rehearsal shoot at eight o'clock mm -hmm. calls me in the office and says, okay, I'm going to tell you one thing. It shows. Okay. But if you want to be different, you got to do the singing scene, the Elvis role quote, the Elvis role. You got to sing. I go, Lauren, I, I have no rhythm. I, I have nothing. He goes, no, 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 it'll be good. We'll tape it. You can mind it or whatever you call it. So I said, okay. So I remember Paulina would be about six months old and I was changing her diaper and I was singing the song rehearsing on Friday the day before the show because I didn't want to mess up all the words. <laughs> You're Most singing to her. Sort of like an Elvis Presley character with Victoria as we're on the, uh, I guess, water skis. But you know what? I'm, I'm glad I did it and it was wonderful. Those, those, as you know, you guys are all great on that show. Well, we had a lot of practice, you know, but uh, we uh, in that sketch, Waikiki Hockey, I think it was called. <laughs> I think I fake skied in. You were with Victoria and then I skied in and then I think you you did a fake punch <laughs> and knocked me out of the frame. But all all week I knew we were going to be side by side with our shirts off. So I was like, you know, we're just I was just kind of kidding. Like, we'll see who's got what, what, you know, you know I, was do I was doing push ups all week, you know. And then I realized when I saw your build, I mean, you're built, but you weren't, you, you said it's all really in the legs. You don't even, you're not a bruiser. You're a, a technician and an artist. So you kept the upper body lighter, right? 
And you know what's ironic about that scene, and people might not know this, I, they, they wanted me to hit like this piece of steak off off a table. <laughs> Guy standing there with a sort of a, a can of some kind, and I'm to hit it into the can, and I I couldn't believe I knocked it in. But Conan O'Brien was holding the can. He was one of the writers on the show. And so every time I'd see him, he goes, you know, I caught that steak. <laughs> He was the steak catcher. Ah, how fun. But what a great time. I mean, you know, Dana, we were, I don't think I had many athletes when I was there. I think we had Michael Jordan, which is a good one to have. And, uh, yeah. and, uh, he was the same way, like out of the element, perfectly normal to be freaking out. Listen, Dana and I are supposedly supposed to be good at it. We we're in sketches that bomb all the time. It's just, that's just the luck of the draw and you can't always nail it. It's not always your, under your control, but when you see athletes come on, it's it's just really fun. And if they try stuff, like if you're singing or everyone knows this isn't what you do, it's kind of just fun to watch this train wreck in a way. Well, Waikiki, Hawaii, like the show was going on live and I'm not exactly sure where it was, but I remember like roars coming from over that side of the studio and then looking at a monitor or something and seeing you. Uh, become Elvis, you know, and, and I thought there was a charisma to your commitment and Elvis was shy, but then he also had this great confidence and that's what I think creates charisma. So when you did that in that moment, I don't know if your wife said it to you, you were a rock star. <laughs> <laughs> Look at the tape. I'm yeah. <laughs> By the way, I'm not saying your show is a train wreck. I'm saying sometimes if things go sideways, it's never really the athlete's fault because they're just put in a ridiculous situation but it is fun to watch because sometimes some sketches go really well and everyone's like hey pleasantly surprised but yeah going back twice is probably tough you get a feel for it you get the nerves out by the end of the show you're like i did it it's a bucket list done can't deal with it thank you <laughs> So let's go. Let's break them down a little bit for fun for real SNL fans. So you got to work with the great Phil Hartman, God rest his soul, great. one of the best people ever and greatest cast members. And he did did a character called the anal retentive man. And this one, he was a anal retentive fisherman, and you were fishing with him. And you got to see him up close to his character and hang out with Phil. What are your memories of that sketch? So it was really um, it was amazing because. When I first met Phil, and you can ask anybody that I know or you know, one thing I know about is every celebrity that ever went to Hollywood, if they're Canadian or not, I knew every guy. And probably because of my friendship with Alan Thicke over the years, I just learned all the way back to Lauren Green, who was Canadian, right? <laughs> and when I got to SNL, I, I didn't realize Phil Hartman was Canadian. And the first thing he said to me is, you know, I'm Canadian. And I went, oh, my gosh, I, I really didn't know that. And he goes, well, and I'm from your hometown. I'm from Brantford, Ontario. And I was so embarrassed. I looked at him and I said, oh, my gosh, I didn't know that. And so him and I, we chatted the whole week. He went to the same high school as my mom went to back in whenever. Uh, it was amazing because he said, I want to do this anal retentive fisherman skit. And. Oh, it's more like a talk show, which is comfortable for me. And I'm like, yeah, okay, that, that's fine. And so we're sitting in the boat at dress rehearsal one day. And I said to him, I said, you know, Phil, I'm sorry. I didn't really realize you're from Brantford. And secondly, I said, the one thing I hated doing with my dad as a kid was fishing. <laughs> so I, mean, I had a good chuckle. Um, he used to tell me stories about when, where he grew up and what area. I was so impressed by him and he was so nice to me and I'm so happy that I got to do that sketch with him um, because he just, he carried the whole thing. As you guys know how talented he was, he said, Wayne, just play off of me. And, you know, if you mess it up, I'll just cover it up. And I said, okay. And that's really kind of how you guys carried every sketch. You guys are so professional. <laughs> uh, I saw, I watched that sketch and you just handle it great and you get eaten by a giant fish at the end. <laughs> yeah, you know, we don't give it away, Dana. Uh, you know, uh, he, um, I think, I think fishing, he doesn't like fishing because it's, it's really melted ice and that drives him crazy. Yeah, I like it frozen. <laughs> <laughs> so there was another uh, sketch that I love the rehearsal because this 
It made me laugh because we were all these celebrities trying to give you advice. In the locker room. Uh, in the locker room. So Phil, once again, was playing Jack Nicholson. I was doing Travolta, and we're just giving you like really inane advice. But anyway, every time Phil would talk to you in the rehearsal, he would say, great one, just like Jack Nicholson saying that. And every time I saw your head go down and you were just <laughs> laughing your ass off <laughs> over and over. <laughs> so speak to that. I know. I pulled him aside on the Saturday. You know, Saturday, as you guys know, is a long day. And I said, Phil, just don't say great one too many times in embarrass." <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know what? Listen, it, it was, uh, I remember Dennis Miller was playing the owner of the team also. And Dennis was standing there. He had a suit and tie on and he was trying to be serious. And every time I looked at him, I kind of started to giggle. Because I think at the time he was doing weekend update. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I would kind of giggle and chuckle. But you know what? It was all good. Dennis is uh, so funny. I, I don't know what, he, what his attitude was there. It must have been. All right, you know, come on now. Let's uh, listen to these actors, okay? They're going to show you how to play hockey, all right? Hey, Johnny T, what do you got? And I was Travolta, and my only advice to you was, you know, maybe everybody could just rush at the net, like, really, really fast. Like, everybody goes right at the net, just super fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> and I, did, I, Dan, I don't know if, uh, Wayne, you golf with Dennis, but when I was younger, you know, Dennis is probably my favorite comic, and we got to hang out right when I got SNL or right before I was opening for him. I used to open for Dana too. And uh, they were always nice, but Dennis and I were playing in Palm Springs. He drives all the way out to Palm Springs. The first crazy thing is he goes, all right, Spudley, we're going to play, uh, you know, wherever out there. And I go out and he goes, all right, so you got your car, follow me. I'm like, follow you three hours to Palm Springs. We can't ride together. And then uh, we get out there and he, on the first hole, first, one thing I do is I go, hey, oh, hey, it was a par five. I go, where's the, where's the fly? He goes, Spudley, you don't have to worry about the green for another fucking 12 shots. Just hit it. I go, oh, okay. And then uh, he goes, uh, and then he duffs two shots. He goes, let's get the fuck out of here. I'm going home. I go, back to LA? I go, dude, don't have a, this much of a temper. God damn. That's Dennis. <clears throat> Wayne doesn't know this, but I was sort of uh, the uh, Dave Semenko of SNL. I like that you got that name. <laughs> just read it off the computer. Dave um, Semenko. What a great, a, what a great I was name. Sort of, I was sort of the enforcer and regulator. Like when I was around Farley and people would bump him, they would go to start a fight and they'd look at me behind him and they'd go, okay, all good, all good, you know, because they knew I'd jump in. <laughs> well, who was that guy, Wayne? What is your uh, remembrance of Dave Semenko? Well, he... First of all, he was amazing because uh, probably the toughest, maybe toughest athlete, toughest hockey player I ever saw, and the nicest man. He would never try to hurt anyone. We were playing a game one time, and I knew the kid on the other team, and he was kind of bumping him, and I said, hey, stay away from him. I want to fight you. Stay away from him. And the kid just kept going back at him. So finally, he dropped his gloves. He threw one punch. And two guys carried him by our bench, and his nose was sideways. And I was sitting on the bench, and I said to him, I told you to stay away from him. <laughs> but he was so by not only uh, his teammates, but he was kind of a hero in Canada and then in Edmonton. Uh, Blue-collar guy, hard worker. Just I can't say enough good things about him. He meant so much to my career. And I don't know uh, people don't aren't as familiar with hockey is that you would have players or teammates that part of their job was to protect you. Right. Or you, how come you didn't get hurt so much? I, uh, or cause weren't they trying to hurt you or jam you up against? I would have yeah, tried to hurt me. <laughs> <laughs> I just six cents, I guess. And part of it was luck, um, quickness, you know, just to get out of the way. Um, you know, when I turned pro in 1978, I was 148 pounds. Um, I remember the first day in the locker room, players were looking at me going, there's no way this kid is going to survive playing against men. And, you know, I just, I guess I started at six and when I played against 11 year olds, I just learned how to protect myself because I was always the smallest guy. 
And even when I turned pro at 17, I was playing against them with men. And that's just the way I did it. Um, I promised my dad I would finish high school. And I did. I played with men who treated me like a teammate and yet respected me as a person. And I was very lucky. Did you did you uh, pay attention to like nutrition? I mean, what was your pregame meal back in those days, in the 70s? It was awful. You know, every game day, though, I would eat steak and potato at 1230. I never changed from the age of 16 to the day I retired. But in those days, you know, in between periods, I'd have a piece of pizza, chocolate bar, a sandwich. I just, you know, knowledge is everything, right? Uh, from concussions, we know more about it. Nutrition, uh, fitness, training. These athletes today are so much better, just the knowledge they have. Um, so, yeah, it was a different time, a different era. Um, I bet there's a lot of professional athletes today have never even seen a cheeseburger uh, or a hot dog. Uh, that's just, they're so uh, dedicated now and they, they, they have such an understanding that we didn't know, right? We, we didn't understand. And also, I don't know if this is real, but a number that LeBron would throw out, or maybe Seth Curry, is about a million dollars a year spent on their body. I guess between the full-time bodywork person and cryo Chefs. chambers and I don't know what, but it seems extraordinary now what professional athletes do. Hey, listen, you know, Dustin's in an individual sport. He has his own personal trainer that he's had for 10 years. He has a personal chef that goes to the tournaments and they eat properly, they rest properly, they have a masseuse. You know, they're doing it properly, right? They, they understand this is their livelihood. Whereas back in our day, when you got to be 40 years old, you're relatively older, right? It's a, a difference. Yeah, if you look at, uh, our, you know, All in the Family, remember that show, Dana? Archie Bunker? He was yep. 21, he was 21 <laughs> oh, yeah. when they shot that. Um, no, he looks <laughs> old. <laughs> <laughs> stifle yourself edith no but it's true i mean i think golfers are at first it was basketball players where they were all lanky in the old days and now they're all ripped and then uh i think golfers are all getting stronger and hitting it farther and i think it's just part of it everything's just getting better stronger people living longer people playing longer well listen every, every sport has changed baseball athletes today are better shaped uh, football players are bigger and stronger. Golfers are – Tiger changed all that when he became – he became an athlete, training and lifting weights and running. Um, and it has a trickle-down effect. Uh, Tom Brady, what he did in football, um, it's just – it's a different world. Look at Dokovic and Federer. Federer is 41, playing well. Uh, Borg retired at 26. It's just a different – Yeah, and also, um, you know, the one thing I, – I don't know if – I was trying to figure out anything equivalent in other sports. It seems like that your special gift was, I, I don't know what the exact quote was, but don't go to where the, where the puck is, go to where it's going to be. <laughs> so if, if Brady's a quarterback and he's seen all this stuff happening on the field, opportunities squashed, maybe an opportunity, all in split seconds, is that equivalent? Is that related at all to what makes a great hockey player being able to see the whole vision of the of the ice and anticipate. Right. Yeah, I, I think that there's a couple of things. W one, you're right about that. The the uh, the vision, the sixth sense of understanding what is out there in front of him. Um, and there's a lot of great athletes that have that. And then there's the special athletes like Jordan, Tiger, um, Brady, uh, Federer, Djokovic, Nadal, uh, that you can't teach being able to play under pressure. And either you, you welcome the challenge and you want to be there in that minute, in that moment, or you can't handle it. And there's two different kinds of athletes. Some guys relish it. Uh, right now you look at a kid like Patrick Mahomes, he relishes being in that spotlight and taking on that pressure. Uh, LeBron always takes on that pressure. Brady did. Um, you know, in our game, guys like Mark Messi and Marilyn Mew, they welcomed that challenge of being in game seven and being on the, in the spotlight. 
And that's when they became the, their best. That's when they became better athletes. So you can teach a guy everything you want to teach him. If he can't handle the circumstances, if they can't handle the pressure, it's all for naught. And there's some athletes that handle it better than others. And some guys just, they have a tough time under that microscope. But the great athletes, and I, I go back to watching George Brad hit and McEnroe play tennis and Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. The bigger the game, the better they play. And they just, it was like what you talked about one of your first questions to me. Did you dream about this as a kid? Game seven, scoring the winning goal or winning basket. That's what those guys did. And you could see the smile on their faces. The bigger the game, the happier they were. And that's why they became who they became. Yeah. Do you, do you see that in present generation? There's Austin Matthews, who's from my town of Scottsdale. There's uh, Sid Crosby. And do you know these guys? Do you see them? Do you talk to them? Yeah, I know them all pretty well. Um, we're, at, we're, we're at a crossroads here. We're from the late 90s till now, about now. Um, Crosby and Ovechkin carried the mantle, and they were amazing. Sid was going to go down as one of the great players of all time, and Alex is too. More importantly, what they've done for the game and for the cities that they live in, Washington and Pittsburgh, they're both champions. And we sort of pass the mantle now to guys like Matthews and McDavid and Nathan McKinnon, Joe McCarr. Um, these kids are amazing. They're good kids. They work hard. They understand the position they're in, the spotlight they're in. Um, the game is probably in a better position now than it's ever been. And they should feel proud about that because they work hard. And you know what? It's a tough grind, but they all live up to it. But what Crosby and Ovechkin did, they carried the mantle for a good 20 years, and they deserve a lot of credit. You know, someone once said you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. <laughs> <laughs> Do you like that it's on The Office and it's like super famous? <laughs> I've I got to be honest. I'm tired of seeing it. I see it everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. They put Wayne Gretzky and then underneath that. It's Michael a great Scott. quote. Yeah, that's funny as shit that he steals it and still <laughs> gives it to you. Uh, also, uh, your uh, lovely daughter was in Grown Ups 2. Um, oh, yeah which uh, Spade had a part in. I met her on that. She was perfectly uh, sweet and polite and nice, and I hope she had fun on that. She seems to be doing well. I see her out more out in the world. I don't see her personally, but I see she's doing great. Yeah, we're, we're, she's doing unreal. Two beautiful grand boys that, you know, people say to me all the time, isn't it great being a grandparent? I'm like, we're not normal grandparents. They travel two weeks a month, and I... I'm like a father again. I said, I got to get up at 6.30. Janet makes some breakfast. We take them to school. And it's all fun. But we're not like those regular grandparents that hand them back at the end of the day. <laughs> wow. <laughs> my son and his wife and daughter live here. And my other son and his uh, fiance live here. So we're all here except for the two kids in college. We're in Florida. And it's really nice. Wow. Yeah, I, you just seemed uh, really, really, really blessed. <laughs> With this yeah. family, um, I, what, what I want to talk about for a second is the revolution in, in um, marketing. Like, I, I bet Gordon Howe didn't make that much money during his career, but now athletes create global brands and right. all kinds of things. And you're you're probably the most successful hockey player as a post career entrepreneur, I, I believe, or one of them. Um, I just wanted to call that out. Greatness wins because I watched a documentary on Misty Copeland last night, or she was on, on a gardener's show. Anyway, she's, she's a partner with you and Derek Jeter mm -hmm. doing that's still going on. Um, do you, do you have a beer company or a sort of, or any kind of so we, winery I or I have a winery in Canada, which some people know about. Some people don't. We're in Niagara on the Lake. Been uh, there. Before the pandemic, we were probably one of the most visited wineries in the world, about half a million people a year, uh, partly because four million people a year go to Niagara Falls for their honeymoons. Uh, we're 10 minutes away from that, but we put out a really nice uh, red wine, white wine, ice wine, vodka, whiskey, beer. Uh, I have a great partner who's been in the business with his family since 1955. 
we have an outdoor hockey rink in the wintertime. The kids can skate and play hockey and have games. So, you know what? Listen, I said this earlier. Everything I have in hockey or in life is because of hockey. Doors have opened and people I've met. As you said, being with Misty and Derek, uh, with uh, uh, Greatness Wins, I originally started with Untucket as an investor and that company did well and he decided to branch out, Chris. And you know what? Listen, I, I can't thank enough uh, my family and friends and people I've met. It's just been a lot of fun for, for all of us. It seems like it maybe satisfies, I don't know about Michael Jordan or Magic Johnson, it satisfies a little bit of post-athletics competitiveness in a way. So you want to win at investing and have your product be the best product. So it feels like it's a natural fit just for something. It's exciting. It's exciting and I love it and I'm enjoying it. And actually two weeks ago, Derek and I had dinner together and Derek's a little bit more involved day to day than I am. But the truth be told, uh, for me, the competitive spirit of winning hockey games is everything. Um, and winning championships, to replace that, I don't think I'll ever have that same high. Uh, that's just me being honest. Uh, but I'm loving what I'm doing, being a grandparent. Um uh, my family is everything, and I've been, I've, I'm lucky that my kids are healthy and my wife deserves a lot of credit. My The greatest compliment you can get as a parent is when people say, you know what, your kids are so polite, and that's because of my wife and what, how she raised them. She was around way more than I was when I was working, but um, I feel very fortunate. I, I've had lived a wonderful life and met some wonderful people, been to some great cities. Uh, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Um, it's been very enjoyable. I just had a, I had a quick question on another <laughs> frequency as hockey movies go. Yeah. Slap shot with Paul Newman, mighty ducks with Emilio Estevez or miracle on ice with Kurt Russell. I don't know if you've seen them, but those are three. I've seen big, them all. Okay. What? Well, let's rank them. <laughs> you ever seen the Gabby do good movie? I think President Ronald Reagan played a New York Ranger in 1947. You have to get a tape of that one day. It was actually pretty good. He would get penalties on purpose, so get in the penalty box and talk to this pretty lady that he ended up marrying. <laughs> and I think the movie was called Gabby. That was one of the first hockey movies I ever saw. Um, but I'll rate them like this. Uh, one of the handsome brothers I played professionally with, Steve Carlson, one year in Edmonton. Uh, I, I enjoyed Mighty Ducks because Michael Eisner used to come to a lot of the hockey games with uh, Janet, and he said, I'm going to do a hockey movie called The Mighty Ducks, and then I'm going to have an NHL team called The Mighty Ducks. And I remember saying to him at dinner one night, you're crazy. How can you have an NHL team named The Mighty Ducks? What do I know? And then uh, the third one was Caddyshack, right? Miracle on Ice. That was about the Olympics. We went to the premiere of the Miracle on Ice, and unfortunately, Mr. Brooks had just passed away. It was very emotional. Uh, it was a wonderful movie. Um, you know, it's hard for me to pick one because they're so different, but I will tell you this. Rob Lowe did a movie with Patrick Swayze called Young Blood, yeah, which yeah. 80s. And he called me one day and he said, I, can I come out and skate with you guys? I'm doing this movie in Toronto. So he came out and skated in a morning skate with the, I was playing on Edmonton then, in a morning shoot around, him and David Foster, and they came out and skated. And he was actually a really good athlete. He was good. So a lot of the younger people love that movie, Youngblood. But all in all, the enjoyment of winning the gold medal, Miracle on Ice, was pretty special. Yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. Kurt Russell's great. Kurt Russell as a, as, as a character, that coach, Again, again, again. They're training them all night long. I mean, he was just torturing them uh, in a good way. Yeah, it's great. Uh, before I go, uh, before Wayne goes and then Dana goes third. Um, but uh, I wanted to say, uh, Wayne, first of all, thanks for talking to us. And I, I don't see you a lot, but when I do uh, on the golf course, you're very uh, polite, very cool to me. Um, your wife, very sweet, fleeced me for maybe three, four hundred dollars. It's fine. <laughs> Dana, his wife plays and she's 
of course, great. And then, um, of course, I got roped into whatever. And anyway, I lost money. Long story short. Um, but I think it's a business write-off. I think. <laughs> and that's it. And Dane, anything else you want to tell this uh, young man before we go? Uh, I just want to say thanks for coming on. And um, you're our first athlete host, I believe. Uh, so Peyton Manning also did a great job hosting. Michael Jordan, they're always welcome. But you're our first. And m my first superstar athlete on that show was your show. And it always crossed my mind as a special show. And um, just been a pleasure talking to you. You, um, you, I give you, uh, I call you the great one of life. Put hockey aside. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's got a lot going on. Oh, by the way, one last thing, just a, the NHL, NHL Turner Sports show that you do um, for, for Turner Sports National Hockey League that you just started doing, right, last year, uh, is is kind of like Charles Barkley. It's sort of like Kenny Smith. Yeah. Are you enjoying that? I love it. I uh, couldn't be with a better company and the people are so nice. And Charles, obviously we see him a lot there because our studios are side by each. It's just been a wonderful fit. And I get to be around hockey periodically and I and, uh, couldn't be happier. And I want to thank you two guys for taking the time to talk to me and you guys are always great to me. And, I wish you all the best of luck with your podcast. Hope it goes great. Thank you. Thank, we're doing, thank you, buddy. We're doing great. Uh, shout out to Paul Bissonnette, Anson Carter, and Liam McHugh. I think I got those names right. Your partners. If you need me to help you with any of the other athletes who do your show, call me. <laughs> <laughs> thank all you, right, Wayne. buddy. Take all right, have a good day. Appreciate it. This has been a podcast presentation of Cadence 13. Please listen, then rate, review, and follow all episodes. Available now for free wherever you get your podcast. No joke, folks. Fly on the Wall has been a presentation of Cadence 13. Executive produced by Dana Carvey and David Spade, Chris Corcoran of Cadence 13, and Charlie Finan of Brillstein Entertainment. The show's lead producer is Greg Holtzman with production and engineering support from Serena Regan and Chris Basil of Cadence 13. 